Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for the properties of biological molecules. And so we're in this video, we're going to specifically talk about the difference between monomers and polymers. We're going to talk about the most commonly found monomers that you will see in living things and how those are used to build the polymers that we see in living things, specifically referred to as macromolecules. So let's get to it. All right. So we're going to describe the properties of monomers and the types of bonds that connect those monomers in biological macromolecules. And we'll be looking at those individually in just a moment. But before we do, let's get into the detail about what is a monomer and what is a polymer. So a monomer is a single subunit. And so monomers are things like an amino acid is the monomer that is used to build up a protein. A monosaccharide is a monomer that is used to build a polysaccharide. And a nucleotide is a monomer that will be used to build a nucleic acid. So the these are sort of the details of these. Monomers are our single subunits, and then polymers occur when we string them together and make a chain. So the question might be, how do we make a chain? So what we will see is that there are ways of breaking apart or putting together these polymers using either the process of dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis. Let's talk about dehydration synthesis first. So over here, what we see is we have these two monosaccharides. That's what these structures represent. And you'll see that I've highlighted a hydroxyl on one and a, a hydrogen on the other. And if we were to remove the hydroxyl from one and the hydrogen from the other, these two monosaccharides will bind together to form a disaccharide. And as a result, they will lose the hydrogen from one and the hydroxyl from the other and form water. So we're taking a water out, that's the dehydration, and we're putting together two monomers to make a larger structure. Obviously, if we repeat this process, we can go from a monomer to a dimer to a trimer, and then ultimately build out to a polymer. In this case, we're looking at sugars, so we could build something like a starch molecule by repeating this process over and over again. Now, let's say we want to break these down to the smaller subunits. We would do the opposite process. So rather than dehydration synthesis, we would do hydrolysis. Hydro referring to water and lysis meaning to cut. And so we're going to use water to cut things. So down here, I can see I have my dimer. And rather than taking out a water, I'm going to put water in. And what we'll see is that a hydroxyl will be added to one of these monomers and the hydrogen will be added to the other. And we will cleave this disaccharide apart to form two separate molecules. So let's talk a little bit about specifically the macromolecule of a nucleic acid. And so in the case of nucleic acids, these are biological information is encoded in the sequence of the nucleotide monomers. So what we'll see here is we have a DNA molecule that is over here and the DNA molecule has two anti-parallel strains that have a sugar phosphate backbone and those are held together by hydrogen bonds holding them together. And inside here, inside the middle, that, that what's being held together are the actual bases, the adenines, the thymines, the cytosines, and guanines. If we were to bring in an RNA instead of thymine, you'd see uracil. And so what we'll find here is that this structure allows there to be a conserved structure of DNA that each one of these strands has a natural complement. And so if we were to pull these two apart, strands apart and make copies because adenine only fits with thymine, we're going to make an identical copy of this strand through DNA replication. The other thing to note about this structure is that the monomers that we're looking at always are composed of the same three components. They are always composed of a five carbon sugar known as a pentose. They have a nitrogenous base. Those are the things that stick in the middle. And we have a phosphate. And one of the things that we'll see is that the DNA and RNA, when they are getting ready to build their molecules, they actually make a nucleoside triphosphate like this molecule down here. So that it has a lot of potential energy and they're only going to be able to add their new bases to one end or the other. And specifically, they're only able to add to the three prime end. And so if I label these molecules here, five prime to three prime, or in the anti-parallel, so five prime to three prime, I'm only gonna be able to target the available hydroxyl groups that are found on the three prime end here. Uh, more detail of this will be given in later videos where we talk about the uh, building of DNA and some of the structure of DNA, uh, but I just wanted to lay that foundation there. All right, so let's move on to 
the structure of proteins. And so uh, proteins are made up of specific amino acids. And so I'm going to pause there for a moment and talk a little bit about the primary structure of uh, an amino acid. All amino acids have the same primary structure. And that primary structure is that of having a central carbon, an amine group, which is this NH2 group here, a carboxyl group, which is a COOH group over here, a hydrogen, and then an R group. And the R group is actually going to give the chemical properties to the given amino acid. And there are 20 common amino acids that we see in this chart over here are the 20 amino acids. And what we'll find is the different amino acids have different properties. So some of these are going to have a hydrophobic property. So they're going to have these hydrophobic side chains. Uh, those are ones that are going to want to avoid aqueous environments. We will also have those that are hydrophilic and hydrophilic ones could have a positive charge. They could have a negative charge. We have some that are uncharged but not necessarily hydrophobic. And then we have what we call the special cases. And these are ones that have something funky going on them. Uh, frequently we have a sulfur bond in them or they have some other unique structure to them that makes them interact in a unique way. Now, important to note is that when you put these together in a chain in the primary structure, this is referred to as a polypeptide. So when you have one amino acid bind to another, it's going to be the amine group of one binding to the carboxyl group of the other. Again, this will happen through a dehydration synthesis and it will form a peptide bond. That's why when you put a whole string of them together, it's referred to as a polypeptide. Now that polypeptide chain is not really a protein until it folds up. And so what we see here is we refer to the chain of amino acids as the primary structure when it starts to interact, where the backbone interact, they can form alpha helices or beta sheets. This is referred to as secondary structure. When the R groups start to interact, then we can start to have things like ionic interactions or disulfide interactions. These can lead to our tertiary structure. And then if we have multiple different uh, subunits of a protein come together, that will lead to our quaternary structure. So there's a lot of detail how we go from the monomer of an amino acid all the way up to the functional protein. And that starts with the structure of putting those amino acids together. And then the properties of those given amino acids will then dictate the folding up and the interactions that lead to the ultimate function of the polymer, in this case, the macromolecule of a protein. Now, when we talk about carbohydrates, carbohydrates are comprised of sugar monomers that are then put together. We talked about that through our dehydration synthesis earlier. But the important thing to talk about the difference between these are the polymers themselves. Usually we think of the monomers or the dimers as available to use for sugar. And so uh, really, if we were talking something like glucose and, you know, we consume glucose, or we're going to have enzymes that allow us to break glucose down and make ATP available. But let's say we take in a disaccharide and that disaccharide is something like a fructose. Well, we're going to break that disaccharide down into the monosaccharides and then again, put those into cell respiration in order to get energy. As you look at different disaccharides, the most disaccharides are going to be broken down, but we are aware that not all disaccharides are the same. And so, for example, you may be aware that some people are lactose intolerant. Lactose intolerant individuals have the inability to break the disaccharide bond that holds together the two monomers that make up lactose. And as a result of that, they're not able to access that for energy. And so the reason I bring this up is that depending on how you put together your two monomers or a string of monomers and how those bonds are arranged, you will need to have specific enzymes to break them down. And the best example of this is starch versus cellulose. Starch is a chain of monosaccharides, and you can see those here, and they are all built in the same exact way. And what you can see is that because of the directionality of how these are bonded together, they make a simple chain. And so we can digest starch very easily. You eat some pasta, you eat a potato, you're going to be able to take that starch, cleave these bonds and break them apart. And as a result of cleaving those bonds apart using amylase, we are going to be able to get access to those sugars and produce energy from them. Now, cellulose is a common polysaccharide that's used to compose the cell walls of plants. And it turns out, if you notice, the bonds here 
alternate in directionality. And because of this alternation of directionality, it turns out we do not actually have enzymes or cellulases to break those down found in our guts. And only certain types of organisms are going to be able to break down a cellulose molecule. So depending on the type of bond or the directionality of these bonds, enzymes may or may not be able to digest the polysaccharides that have been put together. So it is important to know that complex carbohydrates are put together in a variety of different ways depending on the orientation of those molecules. Now, our last of our macromolecules is the lipid. Now, the lipid is kind of interesting because it's a little different than the other macromolecules because it's not a true polymer, meaning we're not going to use dehydration synthesis to put together a long chain of molecules. We're not going to be combining different triglycerides together or different phospholipids together, but because of the chemical properties of these lipids, they will interact in a way that allows them to come together and serve their functions. So one of the first things to note is the concept of saturation. And so I'm going to focus down here on this molecule here. And what we can see, this is a phospholipid. Phospholipids are very commonly found in a lipid bilayer. So again, I see my lipid bilayer here. And one of the terms that we often use are the terms saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids. And now a saturated fatty acid is one where there are only single bonds in the long chain of the hydrogens and carbons that make up the long fatty acid chain. If we were to put a double bond anywhere in that chain, so rather than just through a single covalent bond, we are going to make a double bond that is actually going to put a little bit of a kink or a little bit of a change of direction to the long chain. And as a result, we refer to this as an unsaturated fatty acid. From the chemical properties, the important thing to note here is that you can pack saturated fatty acids more closely together and unsaturated fatty acids cannot pack closely together. So one example you can think of is something like butter versus vegetable oil or olive oil. At room temperature, you can pack a lot of the saturated fatty acids that are found in butter together and you can leave a stick of butter out at room temperature and it will remain as a solid because you are able to pack those lipids together really, really tightly because it is packed full of saturated fatty acids. Oils at room temperature are just that, they're liquid. And the reason for that is you cannot pack the molecules quite as tightly together. And as a result of that, they stay as a liquid at room temperature. Now, in living things, you're going to see a combination of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids used. Um, a lot of times this will have an impact on lipid bilayers and the temperature where you find uh, the living organism. We may talk a little bit about this later when we talk about living things as it applies to the lipid bilayers of something like plants in different environments, but I just wanted to identify those concepts. The other thing to notice is that fossil lipids contain both polar and non-polar regions. So lipids as their general rule, and if we look at these lipids up here, specifically we look at a fatty acid chain or a cholesterol or a triglyceride, these molecules up here, they are non-polar molecules. But as we know, the lipid bilayer that makes up our biological membranes is known as a phospholipid. And what this has is it, it has a hydro philic head to it, a phosphate that's been added along with a hydrophobic tail. This creates an environment where you're going to have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions to a membrane and it allows it to form a barrier that will help be selectively permeable about what can get into and what can get out of a cell. All right, that was a lot of information about uh, the structure of our macromolecules. I hope that was helpful and I will talk to all of you soon.